Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Terence, why don't you sit down? My name is Andrew Constantine, and um, I'm conducting tonight. And as you can perhaps tell from my accent, I don't come from around here. Um, I come from Baltimore. <laughs> and uh, my distinguished colleague here is, is Terence Wilson, who's going to be our soloist tonight in the Mozart Piano Concerto number 21. And uh, when they asked me, oh, let me move this stand so I can see you. When, when they asked me the other week if I would uh, if I'd take part in a pre-concert talk, I thought, what a wonderful idea. Um, but it's all in the program notes. And you have wonderful program notes here, as well as a fabulous hall and a really tremendous orchestra. We've had a, we've had a great week working here with this orchestra. And um, I think they're very fortunate not only to have this hall, but to have you supporting them. And it really is a, a fabulous musical experience working here. So I thought for uh, a few minutes I might just talk to Terence before he, he goes and warms his fingers up. And Terence and I have worked together on uh, several occasions before, um, a few years ago now. But um, I'm going to do an interview, if that's all right with you. And so, Terence Wilson, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you're not from around here either. <laughs> well, I, I'm from the Bronx, uh, which... Um most people don't think I'm from the Bronx because they don't hear a Bronx accent. But, but in any case, um, I grew up in the Bronx and I went to school at Juilliard in New York City. And um, I, s I started playing the piano actually when I was eight years old. My mother bought a piano for the living room as a piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, was, that happened around the same time that I discovered classical music on the radio. Um, at the time, there was a station called WNCN. And um, I remember my, the first thing I heard on that station was, uh, I think it was Arthur Rubinstein playing the first ballade in G minor of Chopin. And um, instantly I fell in love with his music and found myself tuning in more and more. And um, I think that was the first inkling that I had that I wanted to pursue a career um, as a pianist. I love what you say about your, your mother having a piano as a piece of furniture. We had exactly the same. We had a piano in our house as well. But when my parents heard what I was doing on it, they locked it. And it was never opened again. And <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite a, f a few years before I, I got going in music at all. But you, you, um, you started at an early age. No other musicians in the family? Well, actually, um, uh, that's not entirely true. My, my parents uh, were musicians, although they weren't classical musicians. Mm. They were rock and rollers. Uh, my, my mother was the lead singer in a girl band called Baby Jane and the Rockabies, and she was <laughs> Baby Jane. And uh, my father was uh, one of five brothers that toured as the Wilson Brothers, and they were an a cappella doo-wop boy band group. So, um, but when they decided they wanted to raise a family, um, they didn't think they wanted to do that on the road. So uh, that's when they got regular nine-to-fives and raised us. Uh, and how did you avoid going into the same line of career then? How did you get into the classical side? Purely by listening to the radio and purely by Rubenstein? yes, purely by listening to the radio. I had um, I had I had my own radio as as a kid, and um, I just happened to be turning the dial, and, and uh, something caught me instantly mm. on WNCN, and uh, and um, I was hooked. Mm. So you then went to music college and, and decided that you were actually going to p pursue a career yes, as I a soloist rather than teaching or chamber music, this sort of well, thing? Well, I, I, um, I started off with a neighborhood you know, community teacher that came to my house every mm. Thursday for half an hour, and he taught me the ABCs um, of the piano. And, um, and then after a year or so, I graduated from him to another local piano teacher. And I worked with her for about four years until finally I would meet Veda Kaplinsky, who was, um, who I, with whom I studied for quite a number of years. First privately in her mm. private studio, and then eventually I would enter in the Manhattan School of Music pre-college division, mm. where she taught in the pre-college division. And then uh, by the time I was 17, I transferred to the Juilliard School of Music pre-college division, and then finally... Uh, I uh, 
I went to Juilliard for the college program. Did you win a big prize or something? Is that something that launched you onto the circuit? Well, the first, um, I, I think the, the real birth of my career was probably when I entered my first, uh, first and really only competition, the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra Junior Concerto Competition. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the winners of that, um, which gave me the opportunity to play a movement from the piano concerto by Aram Khachaturi. Mm. And, uh, and it went very well, and subsequently, uh, Ricardo Muti had heard about that and engaged me to play uh, a concert uh, in honor of Martin Luther King. Wow. And that was my, I think that was my first professional uh, gig mm. when I was 15. Amazing, yeah. amazing. And I, and I've got to tell a little story, if I can, about one of the occasions that that um, Terence and I worked together with the Baltimore Symphony probably about five years ago now, something yeah. like that. And um, we were playing a piece by Michael Doughty um, called Tombo de Liberace. And um, uh, it, it has a variety of strange movements in it. One of them is a, is a rhinestone kickstep. It's very colorful music, as much music theater as anything else. What, what are the other movements called? Do you, do you remember? Uh, the other, uh, there was a movement called How Do I Love Thee? Uh, and then there was uh, another movement called Sequin Music. Sequin Music, yes. yeah. This, this um. is a fabulous piece of music. <laughs> it's really good fun. And, <laughs> and the um, first movement, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. The first movement is Rhinestone Kickstep. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> a really exciting one. But it, it begins with about um, nine bars of solo piano, something like this, and then you start conducting the orchestra. And um, because we had to make a scene change, um, the, the, the piano lift was down and to add some sort of continuity I decided I'd just talk to the uh, audience and try and say something remotely funny or keep them engaged and um, as this was happening the piano lift is coming up and Terence is sitting at the piano as it's coming up and he's just improvising a little bit and I thought oh, that's nice that's nice what he'd worked out and hadn't bothered telling me <laughs> was that the, the opening nine bars that we were going to start in a little while were um, um, very similar to I Got Rhythm. And he was just improvising around that. As the piano came up and I'm talking away, I suddenly thought, he's actually gone straight into the piece. He's just morphed seamlessly into the introduction of the piece. And I swung around to the orchestra and went, bar five, bar six, bar <laughs> and then we started then. It was absolutely incredible that, that he just seamlessly improvised into this, into this little piece of of late 20th century music from a wonderful piece of Gershwin like that. So <laughs> was that a trick you were playing on me, or is it just something that happened? Was it unintentional? Oh, it was, You've it never told me. <laughs> Now's the time. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I... I Come on, tell the truth. I paid for lunch, so which, which is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I... I, I I think I'd worked that out just as the, as the lift was ascending. And exactly. <laughs> you see? Exactly. <laughs> Well, y you don't do anything like that in the Mozart, do you? Oh, um, not quite. <laughs> not quite. Well, you know, there are, there are places in uh, Mozart concerti, such as this, um, where, you, uh, where it is called for to improvise, but not, uh, not in the same sense as, as we did in the Doherty, but um, there are fermatas where the soloist is, um, is asked to... Uh, you know, play a um, a decorative passage leading in to back into the main theme, and uh, and that's uh, that's about the only time, except maybe when playing, I don't know, maybe Rhapsody in Blue or something. Okay. So which brings, which actually brings me to the second piece that we played. Didn't we play Rhapsody in Blue after that? I thought we did. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so. We're playing Mozart tonight, but is, is Mozart the, the area you feel most comfortable with, or do you prefer playing bigger concertos, or is it all equally satisfying for you? Oh, it's all, it's all very satisfying. Um, although I will say, honestly, that there was a while that I didn't, I didn't play Mozart, um, because I was known uh, more for playing uh, bigger romantic repertoire. And... Uh, it wasn't that I wasn't interested in playing Mozart, but it just so happened that my early, my early opportunities to play um, 
happen to be opportunities to play Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky and Grieg and so on. And uh, so I, I've, I've really made an effort to, to make it known that I also enjoy playing, playing Mozart, Mozart and Beethoven and so on. So I've, I've, one of the projects that I'm doing uh, for the next couple of years is to play all the Beethoven concertos. And um, I've, all, I've, all, I've got almost all the five uh, piano concertos booked uh, for the next two seasons. And I'm also doing um, the triple concerto of Beethoven oh, next season wonderful. with the Jacksonville Symphony. And you also commissioned the composer Michael Dowdy to, to, to write a piano concerto that's been incredibly successful, didn't you? Yes, it's a very different piece, I have to say, from the Tombo de Liberace. <laughs> um, yes, it's, I, I think it's a fascinating piece. Uh, Michael Dougherty, uh, he's known for writing pieces that are um, inspired by um, uh, American elements of American pop culture. Yeah. Um, the be it, a, the be it, be it a, a historic event mm. or some famous iconic person or place or a thing. Um, and um, yes, yeah, such as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Dead Elvis, and he has an opera called Jackie O, and he has, um, he has, a, he has a piece called Flamingo uh, that was inspired by, uh, you know, the pink flamingo lawn ornaments that you find um, in the rural back roads of middle America. And, uh, really? Yes, a lot of things like that. And the piece that he wrote for me, um, which is called Deus Ex Machina, um, is what, inspired... What was that? What's it? Deus Ex Machina, God of the Machine. Ah. Um, and, um, well, the title is, is not an allusion to the, uh, the, the, the theatrical, the Greek uh, tragedian, okay. uh, Deus Ex Machina, you know, where some unlikely... Uh, hero, you know, who would save the day in a, in a seemingly um, unsolvable plot, you know, some sort of uh, impasse in the, in the plot. And, but rather, um, the world of trains. Um, and it was inspired by uh, the paintings of the Italian futurists, um, Umberto Boccioni um, and F.T. Marinetti, this, um, this uh, movement in art that, that revered speed and dynamism and the power of machine technology. Um, and uh, the great masters of the early part of the 20th century uh, were using the image of a speeding locomotive in their paintings. Um, Rene Magritte's Time Transfix, mm -hmm. which features a, the image of a speeding locomotive emerging from a dining room fireplace and so on. And have you recorded this piece? Yes. Um, Available in the lobby? Uh, <laughs> no. No? <laughs> on iTunes <laughs> and Amazon. But it is, uh, it is on the Naxos label. And I was, I was actually very, very shocked and, and excited to hear that um, the, the recording is uh, five Grammy nominations. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, Terence, um, where do you go from here? So maybe it, it's time on that applause for you to... Go and warm your fingers up, do you think? Or you <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so next week you were telling me you're, you're off to uh, uh, Arizona? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Well, what are you playing there? More Mozart? Uh, no, um, I'm celebrating the birthday of another famous composer next week, Franz Liszt. Oh. Um, this is the bicentennial of Franz Liszt, who of course was born in 1811. So uh, we're doing an all-list concert hmm. where I'll play the concerto in E flat. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, Terence, I know you need to warm up. So yeah. Well, it was you. nice conversing with you. I'll have another conversation of we'll sorts with you a little bit later. Thank you. Terence Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. So the next thing I need to do, I think, is make a little apology. I've taken real liberties with this program. I know it's, it's a Mozart birthday program and they asked me to put together a program that was all Mozart and I thought, oh, do I have to? Um, I mean, you know, the guy is, what, he would be 255, something like that. Even he would be thinking, let's listen to a little bit of something else maybe, don't you think? Whatever. It's like, 
if you do all Mozart all the time, it's like um, on your birthday. You remember that train set we gave you last year for your birthday? Well, here's another one. No? Okay. Well, I thought that when Mozart died, there was still a composer around, Joseph Haydn, who Mozart had revered and who for a time was very close to Mozart. Haydn seems to very rarely get performed um, in the symphonic literature these days, and I thought it would be nice to include a piece of Haydn on this program. So anyway, that's my apology. Um, but then I need an even bigger apology for sticking a piece of English music in there, don't I, by somebody totally unrelated to, to Mozart. And the, the Butterworth piece we're going to play, I thought had a, a parallel in a way with Mozart in that it was written by somebody who died very early in life and showed enormous promise and was regarded as the, the bright new thing of, of music in England at the time. And um, as you probably read in your program notes, was very tragically killed at the Battle of the Somme in um, 1915, I think, something like that. Um, all of 31 years old, which is appalling to think. And we have very few pieces of his that have um, survived. He, he destroyed most of his early works and sketches before he went off to the war, but he was regarded very highly by composers like Vaughan Williams, who um, dedicated his, his London Symphony to, to Butterworth when he heard that he'd been killed in action. And I found something out very strange the other day when I was doing some research into this piece, um, and that Butterworth was in something called the Durham Light Infantry at the, at the Battle of the Somme. And my young grandfather was in the same regiment, in the same battle, and I'd, I'd never known that. And um, I just decided when listening to this wonderful, at times ethereal piece of music, that perhaps they met. It's a very romantic notion, I know, but it's, um, it's a sort of visual image that, that is, uh, is quite magical. I knew my, my grandfather a little before he died, and uh, he had a few stories to tell about those occasions, and was obviously something that marked people's lives forever. Uh, the, the Butterworth, though, is an idyllic little piece. It's, if you haven't heard it before, I don't think you've heard it, I'm sure you'll know the tune when it comes along. And um, it's something that has found its way into a lot of television commercials, advertisements in England, much like the second movement of the Mozart Piano Concerto. So there was another bizarre little parallel, I thought. Um, I think it says in your program notes that Elvira Madigan, this Swedish film from 1967, uh, used the slow movement in that movie. And somebody was talking to me the other day, and they said, you, know, you remember the movie, don't you? He said, no, I was, I was brought up very well. I wasn't allowed to watch Swedish movies when I was young. My parents wouldn't let me, quite rightly too. Um, but it was used in England for a variety of things like cigar commercials and things like this. It's very languid music, the Mozart, and the, and the, um, the Butterworth is very similar, and it's turned up as um, commercials for soap, for insurance, and for a great variety of things. So there's my apology over for both, including some Haydn and some Butterworth. And these really are excellent program notes you have here. I think they're written by somebody who is an ex-member, former member of the orchestra, and um, I might be trying to get his phone number or his email because uh, they're, they're, they're super, and I might try and steal some or borrow some from him, use elsewhere. Terence was telling us how he began in music, and um, people ask me how I got involved in music and how I became a conductor, and it's not really a standard route, I don't think, if there is such a thing as a standard route into music. Uh, I was born in the northeast of England in a very working class community. There were no musicians in the family and I don't think anybody had been to college or anything like that. And um, I was at elementary school, about to leave elementary school, and I was always in trouble. Always in mischief, breaking windows, things like this. I think I was bored. And I was much more interested in soccer than anything else, as I perhaps still am. Who knows? Um, and there was one day in class, the principal came in with a clipboard and she stood in the corner of the room and the class teacher went up and they were talking and they were looking over it 
and they read out my name. They said, Andrew, come here. I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything this week, I'm sure. So I got up, reluctantly went out, and I stood in front of them, and they said, hold your hand out. Oh, no. And I was ready for some sort of smack or whack or whatever. I put my hand out, turned away, and they got hold of my hand, turned it over a couple of times, and they said, yeah, you've got big hands. You're going to play the cello. Okay. I went and sat down. I went home that night. I said, hey, guess what, Mom? I'm going to play the cello. Wonderful, she said. What's a cello? I don't know. But I'm starting lessons next Wednesday. And um, next Wednesday came, and I spent the whole lesson being taught how to take it in and out of the case, and which bits I couldn't sit on, which was most bits. Uh, went home and forgot and sat on the bow and broke it. Um, and started to get really interested in music and the cello in particular. And much as Terence was saying, it was just a, a chance hearing of some music on the radio played by a cellist that got me very interested. And um, I discovered that if you practice, you get better. And if you get better, you like it more. So that was fine. I loved that. I still had illusions that I was going to play soccer for England. Um, that never happened. Um, and I played the cello for a good few years, and somebody decided I was quite good at it, and I went to a, what's called a specialist music school when I was about 14 or 15. Then went to college in Manchester, the Royal College in Manchester. And then I decided I wanted a little break from music, and I was going to do a degree in philosophy at university. So I went to this university to do this degree in philosophy, and that lasted for a day. And on the second day, I thought, I can't spend three years with these lunatics. So I, uh, any philosophers here? So I just couldn't abide it. So I went, I went to the music department and said, please, let me change. Let me do a degree in music. So I did this degree, and um, when it uh, came to my final year, um, they wanted to find out what they'd been spending their money on because they, um, uh, because my cello playing was, was of a higher level, it seemed, than they wanted for graduation. They gave me money to go to London to have conducting lessons. And um, they wanted to see what I'd spent the money on. So they said, we want you to conduct a concert, but not with one of our orchestras. You have to have your own orchestra. Well, that's not fair, is it? Just because if you have a violin exam, you bring along your own violin. If you have a conducting exam, do you have to bring along your own orchestra? Uh, that was a bit of a cheek. But I got this little group together, a chamber orchestra, and um, that's how I started conducting this, this little group to get me through my university exams. Then a few years passed, and I'd been working as a cellist and teaching the cello, but I really wanted to pursue a career as a conductor. And there are really three ways to succeed or get a, a, con a conducting career launched. One is to be a very good pianist and to work in an opera house as a repetitor, something like this, then get your chance to conduct there. Another is to win a conducting competition. Or the third, and the most tried and trusted version, is to have lots of money and to buy a career. And that sounds very cynical, but lots of careers, lots of wonderful careers have started that way. Many great conductors were fortunate enough to have their own money to uh, set up their own orchestras. Sir Thomas Beecham is an example of this, a, a great conductor from, from Britain who founded not only the British National Opera, which became English National Opera eventually, but also the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and the London Philharmonic. So if it hadn't been for him and Beecham's pills and the money from, from those, we wouldn't have had those great institutions. Well, I didn't have any money, and I already told you that my mother locked the piano, so I never became a, a wonderful pianist to pursue that route. So I decided that I'd go in for some competitions. And um, I did three competitions. One I came second, one I won, and one I didn't come anywhere at all, for very good reason. I was absolutely terrified. And I remember this occasion, it was in Siena in Italy. And um, just before I was about to go on stage, my wife said to me, Andrew, are you okay? I'm fine. Absolutely fine. You sure? Yeah, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. 
what's wrong with your shirt? And I looked down at my shirt, and it was like this. <laughs> and my heart was literally jumping. And so not surprisingly, I didn't do very well in that competition. And then the next year, there was a competition in Leeds, a very, um, very important competition that I worked really, really hard for and really put everything I could into this competition. And I didn't win it. I came second in that. And I um, was quite disillusioned by the whole thing. I thought, well, am I really going to get anywhere in this? And the next week, there was another competition in London. And uh, I said to my wife, I'm, you know, I'm just not going to go to this. There's, there's no point. I didn't win last week, and I haven't done any work on the pieces at all. And she made me go, mainly because we'd spent a lot of money on the entry fee, and I think she wanted me out of the house for a few more days instead of moping around. So I went to do this competition, and lo and behold, I won it. And it uh, provided a wonderful prize. Um, most useful was a, a huge check, which we spent very quickly, and um, a series of engagements with very important orchestras. And the, the very first professional concert I had was in the Royal Festival Hall with the London Philharmonic Orchestra with the Royal Family present. And um, that was another occasion when somebody could have said, what's wrong with your shirt, Andrew, just before I walked out? Because that was, that was really quite a, um, a traumatic experience before I got on stage. Loved it when I was out there, but just before going on, that really is terrifying. Now, I'd done this competition stuff, and you think, well, that's the route you go. But at that point, I'd said to myself, well, that's all well and good, but I haven't I haven't really studied properly. I, did, I had a few lessons in London while I was at university, but I don't really think I'm ready to be inflicted on the concert going public yet. And so I decided I'd either come to this country to study or I would try to go to this man who taught in Leningrad. And in the end, I went to Leningrad and I studied with an amazing teacher there called Ilya Musin. And um, the reason why I, I touch on that subject that his student that he was most proud of after being head of the conducting department in a Leningrad conservatory for over 60 years was a name you perhaps know very well, and that was Semyon Bishkov, who, of course, was music director here. This is the orchestra that launched his career, and a great and wonderful conductor he is today. So I went to study with this man in Leningrad and had some marvelous experiences there, some real life lessons, if you like, um, the, the most telling of which, I think, was an occasion when the Berlin Philharmonic came to town. This was in 1991, and there was nothing to eat in Leningrad. It was a really desperate place. Berlin Philharmonic came to town with Claudio Abado, and Abado had heard of this teacher, Musin, through Bishkov, and he wanted to meet, meet Musin. So all of the students of Musin, we went along to the to the rehearsal, and afterwards we're standing around with Claudio Abado waiting for Musin to arrive and have this meeting. Musin never turned up, and he was about 90 or 91 years old at the time. And it was snowing heavily outside, much like it is today, and we all trudged around to his apartment afterwards and um, knocked on his door. There he was, Maestro, Claudio Abado was waiting for you. you. You wanted to meet him, and he wanted to meet you. Why didn't you turn up? And he said, oh, well, we had no bread. And so I had to go and join the line and get some bread. And there wasn't time to come after that. And this 90-year-old man had been out there queuing for bread in the snow. And that really was um, a lesson that was very quickly learned by me that the greatest of talents aren't always necessarily rewarded in the greatest of ways. And he was, he was the most wonderful and unassuming musician and teacher that, that you could ever meet. The only person I think I've ever met who was greater than Musin was Leonard Bernstein. And they were, that gives you an indication of the, of the level of this, this man's greatness. And in the end, I um, actually left the Leningrad Conservatory because they threw me out. And they threw me out by confiscating my passport and visa. And when they returned it, I only had a single exit visa. And as the conservatory at the time was run by several people with KGB affiliations, I thought, well, when I go, I'd better stay out for a while. Um, but the, the story that led to that happening was after the incident with the Berlin Philharmonic, 
and this guy queuing for his bread and missing meeting Claudio Abado, I found out that there were three foreign students in the class, and the conservatory was being paid on behalf of each student either four, five, or six hundred dollars a month. So there was between twelve, eighteen hundred dollars a month going to the conservatory. And then I found out that Professor Musin was paid 600 rubles a month salary, which at the time was the equivalent of $6, which is not a lot of money. And so I refused to, to be part of this, and I refused to um, let any payment go on my behalf to the conservatory. And so they threw me out. And whenever I went back, I went um, surreptitiously through Moscow, and then got on a train and tried not to let anybody know in Leningrad that I was there other than the teacher and studied with him privately. But the really bizarre thing about this is that there was a, a, a magazine article about me in the UK and I told this story in the article. And a copy of the magazine got back to the conservatory and the director of the conservatory was outraged that I had this information as to how little the professors were paid. And um, as a result, all of the professors who were paid, who were teaching foreign students, were paid in currency after that. And so this incredibly frail old man at this point was able to get somebody to go and get his bread for him, and do some other chores for him as well. So I felt as though I'd achieved something, even if it hadn't been just the musical aspirations I had while I was there. But the truly ironic thing about this is that the guy who, and I say, was head of the conservatory, then offered me an honorary doctorate if I would act as an ambassador for the conservatory in the UK. And I, of course, didn't accept it. Um, he's now in prison, by the way, so it, uh, it shows that the crime doesn't pay. So there's a very convoluted route there, as you can see, that I've taken to getting into conducting. And um, just to finish off with telling you how I got to this country, I came up to this country with my family seven years ago to work at the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and to work as associate conductor there to the then music director, Yuri Temerkanov, who is also, although now in his 70s, a pupil of this incredible guy, Ilya Musin, and a very good friend of Semyon Bishkov. So that's how I came to this country and uh, worked with him there for three years. Initially, I came on a, a two-year contract and um, thought that it was a perfect time for our kids who were eight and 11 at the time to experience a different lifestyle, which is very much what they, they have in this country. Um, but as you can see, we've stayed a lot longer than that. And somebody asked me the other day if, if our children were settled here now. And to give you a, an example of this, last year I went over to England with my son to go to some soccer games. And we were there about seven days. And on day six, he said, OK, Dad, I'm ready to go home now. So um, I think we're very much settled in this country, so maybe you need to get used to the accent, I don't know. Um, I also work in Fort Wayne in Indiana as music director there, and in Reading in Pennsylvania. And although Reading is much smaller, in many ways there are, I see great parallels between the Reading community and Buffalo in that there's an amazing groundswell of support for the orchestra. And to me, this is what making music is all about. It's not making music with institutions that have one huge donor, sponsor, bank behind or whatever. It's making music with orchestras that really are relevant to the whole of their community and are accessible to everybody as well, which is one of the main reasons why I've had such a, a lovely week here in Buffalo. And I've really enjoyed working with your musicians. I think we've all had fun together on this stage. I hope that becomes apparent in the concert. And um, if I reminisced a little too much about my strange time in Russia, I apologize for that.